And uh, we have a variety of technologies to, uh, you know, tackle some of the hardest environmental concerns that are out there. Things I can tell you that even 15, 20 years ago, we already had the data that we could detect PFAS in human blood. Right now, the testing is only being done on the first six of these. these exactly. they're, they're, for drinking water. Yeah. Drinking, sorry, yeah, yeah, to clarify, yeah. for drinking water. And so people, one of the things, it sounds like you're trying to say is people should not just be thinking about how to remove these six when they're planning their next improvement, their treatment plan. So EPA just came out with a, a final methodology for a, a test that tests for 30 different compounds, including the compounds of incomplete destruction. Well, these are the things that when you put it into a large body of water or you put it down where it can meet up with an aquifer, this is what recharges our aquifers that actually get it back into our drinking water. Oh, well, that's a great that cycle. You're not really solving the problem. You're just putting a Band-Aid on. The individual homeowner with a well, they're not they're not getting protected, for example, uh, because like while well, someone at Denver Water will be because that's it's being dealt with at the water drinking plant. Those the, the goal is to protect kind of everyone in between. And PFA. Hey everyone, thanks for coming to today's show. I've got Sally and Tanya with BioLargo. Thanks for coming on. Uh, thanks for having us. So give me a quick overview on BioLargo. Catch everyone up. BioLargo is a tech innovation. Our motto is to make life better. And uh, we have a variety of technologies to, uh, you know, tackle some of the hardest environmental concerns that are out there, things like PFAS, micropollutants like ibuprofen and pharmaceuticals in your water. Um, we tackle odor in wastewater plants, not always easy to do, where we actually eliminate the odor instead of masking it. Um, we now have a new battery division um, with a liquid uh, sodium battery that we just did a ribbon cutting on our um, pilot plant in Tennessee. Um, and as always, you know, we're, we're looking for ways to, you know, help the environment and help people's lives be better. Sweet. So talking about PFAS, because essentially in Colorado, um, they're starting to test, well, I think everyone in the U.S., they're testing all their source water, or actually an effluent plant, but should be testing source water. Um, I guess you've had a lot of experience. Where Do you know kind of how they... How they determined that was something we should be remembering. Yeah. So it's been a long journey, right? So the agency for many years. So I worked at the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency in their Office of Research and Development for a number of years. And I can tell you that even 15, 20 years ago, we already had the data that we could detect PFAS in human blood. So we already knew that far back. So that whole process has been, you know, we knew about it. Did we have a lot of information on potential adverse effects? I think there are many studies out there that kind of, uh, that, yeah, it's very harmful to humans. And from that, there's processes in place that are part of the overall authorities that the federal agency has to uh, collect data on the occurrence of these contaminants. You know, just to find out, is it, is it really widespread? What kinds are out there? And so there's uh, the process is is an information collection rule for unregulated contaminants in drinking water. And so over the course of years, utilities, primarily the large utilities, uh, they collect the information on the occurrence of these chemicals. And that's what's gone on here over the last few years, so to speak. 
And as a matter of fact, the agency is still collecting data. So there's 25 more that are like being uh, measured. 20 other, 25 other contaminants that are being measured. PFAS. Or native that are in on the unregulated contaminant market. Uh, so well, we, talked, that. we talked last year. I told you that the, the, the first ones they were looking at were not. That wasn't the whole list. That wasn't the whole list. If I remember. Technically, yeah. it was the, the original pyramid was four to eight to 16 to 25 to 40 to 60. Yes. Yeah. So there, well, there's still an active data collection uh, that is going on. Uh, I think it's important also to note that the agency develops, you know, health advisories. These are non you know, non MCLs that maximum contaminant levels in the, in the year. But through time, the agency has looked at, you know, risk assessments and has developed, you know, numbers. And at first, it was 70, right? That that they were looking at as the health industry. And then it was very quickly uh, brought further down, further down, further down. And then just this year, under the authorities of the federal safe drinking law, the agency did uh, establish maximum containment for these things. to, you know, just begin the process. But that's just the beginning. And that first step was just drinking we know that the PFAS, these fluorinated compounds, are in wastewater. They can be uh, in landfill leachate, To Every time you will do an analysis, you're going to find it in there, right? And, and so, although the agency hasn't finished the work, on establishing um, kind of more uh, the construct on the wastewater side, that part is not. And then there's the whole part about are these compounds uh, hazardous? So if once they become a hazardous waste, well, now now we've got a serious disposal issue. Because the cost to dispose of the hazardous is high. So right now, the testing is only being done on the first six of these. These exactly. there, there. Drinking, yeah. drinking. Sorry, yeah, yeah, to clarify yeah. for drinking water. And so people, and one of the things it sounds like you're trying to say is people should not just be thinking about how to remove these six when they're planning their next improvement, their treatment plan. So what, sure. right, yeah. planning that. Okay, yes. we already know that they're looking at this pyramid of seventy plus. Yeah. Well, what happened is, so the traditional treatments that have been the best available technologies, those treatments really focused on long chain PFOS. It's your PFOS, PFOA. You start getting into the shorter chains, and you start looking at the Gen Xs, the PFBSs. Um, those are much harder to capture in traditional treatment because the molecules are as polar, because they're smaller molecules, they tend to flow right through traditional treatment or they'll be captured for a small amount of time. But then they'll either be uh, sloughed off the media or you'll get a channel and they'll run through real quick. So there you have to go towards the innovative technologies to really pull them out. And it's important to note that we're taking it out of drinking water because of the effect on, on our health. But if you don't take it out of the wastewater and out of the leachate, you can't break the cycle. Yeah. Because when you most of your wastewater plants, most of your leachate is either going to be uh, done into a stream discharge, a water discharge of some kind, so, oh, yeah. a lake, yeah. a stream, whatever, or it's going into a deep well injection. Well, these are the things that when you put it into a large body of water or you put it down where it can meet up with an aquifer, this is what recharges our aquifers that actually get it back into our drinking water. Oh, that's a great that cycle. You're not really solving the problem. You're just putting a Band-Aid on it. Because, for example, the individual homeowner with a well, they're not they're not getting protected 
for example, uh, because like, well, someone at Denver Water will be because that's it's being dealt with at the water drinking plant. Those the, the goal is to protect kind of everyone in between. And PFAS migrates in an aquifer very quickly. So it, uh, it it will migrate just because it's injected, you know, or it, it finds its way into an aquifer, you know, two miles from a well. You could see it in that well uh, that's two miles away fairly quickly. Like a year, a month, or depends on the water table. Just how it is. Okay. Any aquifer too. That but it is. It is a. It is a chemical that migrates quickly. Okay. So, what options are out there to remove PFAS? Yeah. Or what are people using? What and then what could people be using? Water side, you've got your traditional treatments. You've got you know granular activated carbon, which will work on your wine chains very well. On a waste. Yeah. I'll never tell you it doesn't work because it does. Yeah. But you produce waste so you've got it the according to uh epa and awwa standards you need to put a lead lag system in that means for a million gallons a day you're putting 160,000 pounds of carbon in when that carbon is spent whether that be a year two years three years depends on how many short chains you have you know what your pfos contamination level is you've got 160,000 pounds of carbon plus water weight to dispose of yeah. Between tra uh, transportation and disposal right now, you're talking $5 a pound. Chucky, $3.50 a pound to put more carbon into the system. You have the option to reactivate the GAC, but right now, reactivation of GAC being approved is very rare, if at all. Yeah. So most of the time, you have to take that and use it into something else. You got ion exchange, but again, it's a once through system. Right now, regeneration of ion exchange is not allowed. So again, once you use up that media, you've got a lot of media, a lot of waste to either incinerate or put into a landfill. RO takes it out great, but you've got to actually treat a concentrate stream. So now you're entering into the new innovations for PFAS, where you find a, a excellent collector and then a disposal yeah. process behind it. So something like us, our is electrostatic concentration unit is a excellent collector. We take out the long chains, we take out the short chains, we take out the ultra shorts, but then we follow our process with a destruction process. Now that destruction process can be electro-oxidation. Um, you can use a collection process on wastewater, like home fractionation, and then follow it by a destruction process. Again, electro-oxidation, you can use um, supercritical water oxidation, you can use something like a Hulk system for destruction. But you're talking about concentrating, taking out the PFAS by concentrating it in some way, yeah. and then following it by a destruction method so it's not ending up in a landfill. It's not ending up, you know, deep well injected. Incineration is a good process as long as your incinerator is getting above 22 to you know 2700 degrees so you get complete destruction and they're doing their stag test to make sure it's not going into the air oh that's a long one. okay you don't want so the epa just came out with a, a final methodology for a uh, test that tests for 30 different compounds, including the compounds of incomplete destruction. What they're looking for is destruction processes that are putting things into the air that shouldn't be. They also came out with um, 1621, like I said, where you're talking about getting complete destruction so that you don't find any absorbable uh, fluorine molecules, which will come from us. And um, talking about, can you talk, tell me a little bit more about the destruction method? Um, so, you, and the, so you're collecting it in the aqueous solution and then destroying it with. We collect it onto a membrane, okay. and then we have a uh, process that we strip it off of the membrane, and then we send it through a different type of electro oxidation where we get full destruction salted out down to inert uh, salts. So, and, and what can you, can you those salts be like? Applied somewhere? Does that have to be able to land hazardous so they can actually go to a landfill or they can be reused in other things um, if somebody would choose to? Uh, but they are non hazardous. Um, we have taken all of the, the PFAS out of it. Um, so for us, 
we take, you know, like I said before, 160,000 pounds of carbon. Our same system with the AEC would produce two to four pounds of waste. We would take that waste and then we would run it through that destruction process and there'd be no PFAS left. So you need to just go in the dumpster in the back. It doesn't need a different No, it doesn't method. need a different method. Okay. Tell me about like the, the setup and the operations of like the different flow ranges. How big are these some of these units? And Half gallon a minute and we're a modular system so we can go all the way up. So we have designs over 3,000 gallons a minute. Um, but we run our system as a service exchange. So what we do is we actually come in. So when our module is used up, next you come in, we exchange that module. We'll take the old module back and we'll do all the membrane stripping and everything away from the customer site. I don't want to do the destruction on the customer site. I want to do it under the watchful eye of a chemist to make sure that I get complete destruction. And nothing that I do is going to cause harm later by kick, you know kicking a hand down the road and yeah, yeah. you know having something come up so we do it all under a controlled uh, facility so you kind of like source all the destruction in one spot so you can really control that environment yeah. and guarantee a, a, an end yeah but something we do that other people don't is we put a process guarantee with our system so for the length of our service contract where we'll come in and exchange those mod modules we'll give you a process guarantee that we're going to remove your PFAS and we're going to destroy it we give you something back that says we destroyed it yeah. Oh, like a like a certificate. Like a certificate, it takes the liability off of your case. Okay. Cool. Where? So, do you have some case studies you could share? Bestpfostreatment.com. Okay. That's going to have all of the case studies up there. People can, you know, get in contact with us on that website, and uh, we'll be happy to share information with them. Okay. Awesome, Tanya. Thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs> thank you for coming on. Yeah. All right.